um, I'm interested in uh, in in politics and uh, art and science, three things that I just bizarre together. Um, but um, uh, what I try to do is uh, think how they could uh, inform each other and develop. Uh, kind of uh, ideas through this uh, th synthesis, uh, if you like. So, um, today's central question, I think, I think, is um, what should we do with uh, political antagonism in art practice? Um, <coughs> and uh, it's a, a response to, in a sense, um, the dominant idea of, or the more dominant form of dealing with political antagonism, or the idea of antagonism uh, in art practice. Um, so, um, politics demands coming to terms with the plurality of opinions, beliefs, worldviews that constitute the social spectrum. That is to say, the acceptance of antagonism as, as, as an ostensible characteristic <coughs> of thinking and doing politics. Chantal Mouffe emphasizes this dimension and prescribes it as a constitutive, as constitutive of politics proper. Mouffe states that it is only when division and antagonism are recognized as being ineradicable uh, that it is possible to think in a properly, properly political way. Mouffe's notion of agonism, you probably all know it, it's um, probably the most popular uh, kind of political theory, that direct political theory that has influenced art in the past few decades, is based on the idea that conflict is the chief ingredient and guarantor of a plurist, a plurist democracy, as well as what constitutes its specificity. Instead of arguing for a rational consensus, agonism argues for a counter-hegemonic dissensus, or what she terms a conflictual consensus, that avoids falling, falling into pure antagonism by reinvent reinventing conflict as a struggle between adversaries rather than a struggle between enemies. This is the adversi adversary principle at the heart of Mufian agonism. Why is this a concern? Agonism has been a go-to concept for thinkers within the field, looking to account for notions of public sphere and democracy within a discourse on art. We can say that it has not only formed a major strain in art and curatorial thinking, but that it has become the normative assumption about how art is supposed to incorporate the political within its discourse. The problem arises when we think of what agonism implies in terms of both intervention and subjectivity, and how it influences the expectations, positions, and language in relation to these two notions in art practice. Mouffe endorses a set of practices that she suggests are counter to hegemonic neoliberal policies by taking up the agonistic approach. What they all have in common <coughs> what they all have in common is their capacity to exploit the epistemological gap between particulars and universals. But in doing so, they conjure up and hold on to a particular subjectivity that is fixed. <coughs> Jeremy, Gilbert, uh, Jeremy Gilbert identifies the understanding of subje subjectivity at play in Ernesto Laclau's and Chantal Mouffe's conception of politics as that, um <coughs> as the subjectivity of Hobbes's Leviathan. Perhaps this subjectivity's two most important characteristics, as uh, Gilbert claims, are what he calls ontological individualism, that is, its insistence on the irreducible reality of the individual 
as the basic unit of human experience. And the second one is the purely negative understanding of the social. That is, the social, the collective, or the group are not understood as having any substantial mode of existence, but instead are thought to exist purely by means of a negation and delimination, a kind of prevention of the free activity of individuals. So it's a, a negative sociality that, um, based, based on uh, the individual as the unit of society. This Leviathan logic of subjectivity contributes to understanding intervention as the exploitation of the epistemological gap between particulars and universals because it is seen as a way to disrupt or interrupt normal flows of information, capital, the, and the smooth functioning of other, to other totalizing systems, or so to speak. This understanding of subjectivity and intervention is problematic and I consider it a dead end for artistic practice. In the late 60s, um, organizational theorist Carl Weick pointed out that the activity of organizing is primarily centered on reducing uncertainty. Or as he put it, the establishment of a workable level of certainty. I will argue in the following couple of pages that agonism equals certainty. In other words, agonism is the structurally anticipated outcome which provides art and its, its, ins, 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 and its institutions with a workable level of certainty. Anthropologist Arjun Apadurai has pointed out that the tendency to think of capitalism predominantly as a type of risk management <coughs> uh, pointed out the tendency to think of capitalism predominantly as a type of risk management. Basing his argument on the older work of economist Frank, Wright, uh, Frank Knight, Apadurai distinguishes between risk and uncertainty. Risks are basically actions you make that have unknown outcomes but are based on forecasted probabilities. Their outcomes, um, they are basically actions you make that have unknown outcomes but are based on forecasted probabilities. Risks, risk is not true and certainty because if it were it would not be susceptible to measurement. Quote, risk is now part and parcel of the machinery of contemporary capitalism and the devices that measure, model, and forecast risks are central to the financialization of modern capitalism, unquote. Uncertainty, however, is external to such devices and forecasts. Uncertainty is primary, risk is secondary. For Apadurai, what defines the current state of capital um, is uncertainty, not risk. The market has embraced a shift. Yeah. The market has embraced a shift from risk to uncertainty at an unprecedented scale. To put it in his words, we are in the presence not of sober risk managers, but of individuals and entities who have chosen to define without any models, methods, or measurements to guide them the space, uh, the space of financial uncertainty as such. This is what he calls the uncertainty imaginary. For example, somebody comes up with an app like Uber and it changes the whole landscape of what it means to like hire a taxi. If we are to take any claim to political intervention seriously, then interventionality, the concept of, the, of interventionality, needs to grasp the uncertainty imaginary in art as it has in finance. As a non-metaphysical force, primarily as a non-metaphysical force, and adduce itself along those lines, which is to say that although we cannot foretell the traction or effect 
on an, interve an intervention may or may not have a priori, this premise of non-predictionism is exactly the basis for a more robust form of intervention making that develops itself for uncertainty and contingency. To achieve, to achieve such uh, uh, intervention, the requirement is first that the whole concept of intervention in art pra practice withdraws from the particular pre-mediated relationship to politics it has established itself upon. This relationship not only places the figure of the artist, group or individual, at the center of the means, but also stabilizes the end as a forethought voluntary agonism. So the connection to risk rather than uncertainty appears in the inclination the institution has to uh, the ang uh, uh, agonistic in that the agonistic in that agonistic actions and interventions end with a probable fixed but unknown end we don't know the exact nature of this agonism but we know that any intervention is basically a form of agonism it's exact nature might be unknown but it's always already forecasted as agonism as a kind of conflictual consensus based on the adversary principle so according to move what she calls critical art is art that format foments the census that makes visible what the dominant consensus tends to obscure and obliterate it's constituted by a manifold of artistic practices aiming at giving a voice to all those who are silenced within the framework of the existing hegemony." Unquote. This agonistic, non-consensual model considers the public space to be a quote, battleground where different hegemonic projects are confronted without any possibility of final reconciliation. This stress on the impossibility of reconciliation which from this quote appears to be like a drastic ban on consensus as a premediated position is the organizational logic behind agonistic interventional action in art practice it reduces its uncertainty and establish a workable establishes a workable level of certainty for artist curator and institution to the extent that it actually becomes the meaning of a lot of what contemporary art is what, what this workable level of certainty in the agonist model produces is what can be called presentism. Presenti presentism, it tells us that the present is always where we have to be and what we have to relate to. But, al but also, more importantly, that this present can never be defined other than an open-ended, irresolvable conflict between different ideas identities, constru constructs, uh, uh, so on, so on, so on. Move puts it this way, quote, the very configuration of power relations around which a given society is structured is a struggle between opposing hegemonic projects which can never be reconciled rationally. So it's an anti-rationalistic form of engagement. Alex Thompson's essay, Polemus and Aegon, identifies further issues with agonism as a modus operandi. For Thompson, agonism, quote, replaces the idea of a public good with politics itself as an abstract value, deprived of any content, content except for the pragmatic virtues of pluralism and tolerance, unquote. This maneuver of substitution or swapping opens up the possibility of imminent critique for all groups in society that are able to identify with this political opportunity and use it. But this comes at the cost of a kind of entrapment. This is because, as Thompson explains, quote, agonists deny the possibility or desirability of citizens being able to free themselves from their attachment to social groups subsidiary to the larger political community 
or whose borders overflow those of the polis. Unquote. It is because of this that the agonist trap only allows us to articulate a distinctive political virtue in terms of the value of political conflict itself. It is in this sense that agonism allows for a form of participation that resembles something like a universality, but a universality in the negative that can only be accessed to the value of a politics of conflict. The passage leading us, and this is where I go into what I'm trying to formulate. The passage leading us out of this scenario, in which we find the general leaning towards agonism underpinning the logic of contemporary institutional and artistic practices, involves a few moves I will, tr I will, tr I will try to quickly flesh out. To reach the first move, we must uh, very quickly look at agonism's supposed opposite, the contending theory of uh, public sphere, which is uh, what Muth thinks is Jürgen Habermas's discourse or discourse uh, ethics. <coughs> it is a theory that Muth strongly opposes. He consist consistently points out that this notion, that his notion of public, public sphere is a place where de deliberation aiming at a rational consensus takes place. Now, uh, political theorist uh, Gulshan Khan finds similarities between both of these discourses on the public sphere, placing them both under the term of critical republicanism. And she explains what this means. She says, Mouf exaggerates the difference between her political prescriptions and Habermas's approach. For both Mouf and Habermas, pluralism is vital, irreducible, uh, is a vital and irreducible element of the modern public sphere. Both thinkers also theorize consensus in republican terms, related to the idea, a concept of a republic, as a set of rules, norms, or practices that preside over the civic association. Contrary to Mouffe's criticism, Habermas's notion of consensus as a regulative ideal does not seek to eliminate conflict, but rather to distinguish between legitimate and illegitimate expressions of conflict. Similar to her distinction between agonism and antagonism, unquote. What is noticeable here is, what is that we can already detect a particular site this is the site of the parliament, uh, based on the Leviathan logic of subjectivity. We have largely limited our discussion of the public sphere in art and curatorial practices uh, to these so-called critical republicanisms. And, both, and what both agonism does with its emphasis on this census and Habermasian Hab 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 discourse does with its emphasis on consensus is something similar to a process of cloning parliament parliamentary history, dynamics, concerns into the site of art. As a result, the way we tend to think of issues such as pluralism and political antagonism and the question of how to work through them in our practices is largely influ influenced by a site that limits our uncertainty imaginary our desire to understand the world, and our intellectual curiosity. This is a need then, there is a need then, to think of pluralism and antagonism without this baggage we carry passed on to us from democratic parliamentary heritage. A need to think of them as tools, or more accurately, as affordances that we can use constructively. So my main proposition today uh, a rough and underdeveloped one, I admit, is that neither agonism nor its opposite can help art and curatorial practices uh, achieve their imaginative potentials. This is to say that art should disengage from both of these notions of the public sphere. In other words, neither more dissensus 
as a supposed form of artistic agency, nor the labor of consensus as the aim for a politically concerned art. Now, uh, to rethink this, I uh, the idea that I'm trying to develop is uh, the title of today's talk, which is what I call uh, nemocentric antagonism. <coughs> the term comes from uh, philosopher. Uh, the term nemocentric comes from the philosopher uh, Thomas Metzinger who uh, is a philosopher of consciousness, um, a philosopher uh, that works with neuroscientists to uh, help us understand how we produce the uh, our selfhood. So, this is basically, in this little passage, uh, is his main, uh, his main uh, thesis. So I'll just read it out quickly, and then I can uh, continue on to the paper here. And I'll end, because I, I had a, a kind of, I was struggling about how to end this. Like more, is it more theory, more philosophy, or is it something more performative? And in the end, I chose more, uh, 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 a more performative approach, but uh, it needs some kind of engagement from you. So I hope uh, you would uh, be generous enough to engage with me in the, in, the, in, the, in the last part of the talk. So, um, Metzinger says um, in his book, Being No One, his magnum opus, um, first, it is important to understand the, cent the central ontological claim. No such things as selves, as selves exist in the world. All that exists are certain information processing systems meeting the constraints of phenomenality while operating under a transparent self model. Now transparency and opacity are terms that Metzinger uh, defines in a very different way from the way we would usually uh, understand them. Um, transparency um, for Metzinger is the idea that we uh, we are unable to see the system that produces our representation of ourselves, the phenomenon of ourselves. So we're transparent in that way. Um, and I'll talk about it uh, in the couple of pages here later. <coughs> At least for all conscious beings so far known to us. It is true that they neither have nor are a self. Biological organisms exist, but, as an, but an organism is not a self. Some organisms possess conscious self-models, but such self-models certainly are not selves. They are only complex brain states. However, if an organism operates under a phenomenally transparent self-model, then it possesses a phenomenal self. The phenomenal property of selfhood as such is a representational construct. <coughs> it, is truly, uh, it, it truly is phenomenal property in terms of being an appearance only. For all scientific and philosophical purposes, the notion of a self as a theoretical entity can be safely eliminated. What we have been calling the self in the past is not a substance, an unchangeable essence or a thing, i.e. an individual in the sense of philosophical metaphysics, but a very special kind of representational content, the content of a phenomenally transparent system model. It is the content of a self-model that cannot be recognized as a model by the system using it. And this, what, this is what transparency means. Like operating when I'm speaking, this is not a self. It's a, a system model that's projecting a self. 
it's uh, and this is the main the main uh, uh, thesis Metzinger tries to um, uh, articulate in his book uh, very successfully. So in his book, being no one, I'll try and simplify this here uh, using my own expressions. Um, in his book, being no one, two thousand and three, uh, and <coughs> his uh, easier, I think, much more kind of. Uh, popular uh, or oriented book the ego tunnel 2009 thomas metzinger lucidly articulates how the brain produces our sense of self and subjectivity scientifically speaking there is no such thing as a self only a process that constitutes a quote purely experiential nature of the self the brain activates a model of consciousness through a process similar to the consolidation of data. This is called the self-model theory of subjectivity. There exists no self but a, but a model that produces the phenomenon of the self. An ongoing process of flocking and chunking clusters of information to constitute what we know as a self. According to Metzinger, we become conscious whenever our brains, quote, successfully pursue the ingenious strategy of creating a unified and dynamic inner portrait of reality. Our brains generate a world simulation so perfect that we do not recognize it as an image in our minds. Then they generate an inner image of ourselves as a whole. This image includes not only our body and our psychological states, but also our relationship to the past and the future, as well as other conscious beings." Unquote. This internal uh, holistic image of oneself is the phenomenal self-model, or the PSM as he likes to call it. For example, there are nights when we do not dream, this means that our brain has not generated our self-model during sleep. But as soon as we wake up, it's kind of turned on. This distinct model of consciousness is activated. Many animals also have phenomenal self-models. Apes, for example, share <coughs> with us this model of consciousness. And like them, we are unable to be aware of our self-models as models. We can access the data, i.e. the content that constitutes the model that is what we identify as a self, but we cannot detect the medium that facilitates this process of self-constitution. We, uh, we do not see, quote, the window, but only the bird flying by. We do not see neurons firing away in our brain, but only what they represent for us. Briefly put, this is what Metzinger calls transparency, which means only having access to the content of our phenomenal states. While humans share this condition of transparency with other animals, most other animals have an entirely transparent model of reality meaning they only have direct and unequivocal access to the content of their selves, but are unable to produ produce any kind of distance to that content, because, quote, this process of representing while you know that you're representing hasn't yet started. It's not running on these animals. This latter process is what Metzinger calls opacity. The capacity, which is the capacity to represent oneself as an entity while knowing that it is a representation. So we need phenomenal self uh, models to function on a daily basis, plan for the future and evaluate the past. As he puts it, quote, if an animal or a child wants to learn how to develop future planning, control momentary impulses, delay rewards, <coughs> and so on, then it is critical that it has an, uh, an inner image of itself, 
however delusional, that tells it, it is you who will reap the future, uh, reap the fruits of, of this or that in the future, unquote. So now, so now that we have, um, very quickly laid out Metzinger's main hypothesis in a simplified manner, I must admit, we can move on to the idea of nemocentric antagonism. Well, nemocentric, the nemo or nemocentrism, centrism uh, uh, is a combination of nemo, which means no one in Latin, and uh, subject, and uh, 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 it, it means a subjectivity centered on no one. A subjectivity centered on no one. Why? Because, according to Metzinger, selves don't exist, like I have just explained. So, although Metzinger was not the first to use the term nemocentrism, it's been used by a number of neuroscientists uh, before him, his theory has um, most thoroughly articulated it. His is an explanation of how we have come to believe we have selves. It is an explanation that establishes what can be called a reductive naturalism. It reduces selfhood to a representation produced by no one, but a mere system, a kind of process that does not have someone controlling it from behind. It is a theory that establishes that subjectivity is actually centered on no one. It is centered on a process. So, if politics is about accepting that antagonism cannot be eradicated, i.e. that it is centered on antagonism, politics centered, this is because and the model of subjectiv uh, the, uh, because the model of subjectivity that it employs or adheres to is this uh, model of subjectivity I've uh, identified before, the Leviathan ontological individualism. So let's accept this as a reality at the register of everyday politics. But it is, but it is not a reality at the register of neural firing and neurocomputational brain processing. At that register, such a subject, such a Leviathan subject, simply does not exist. She or he is a representation that only seems or appears to be a genuine subject of experience to herself or himself. I'm showing here images of uh, a few images from a work by Amanda Beach, a um, British artist based in uh, Los Angeles. Um, and a lot of uh, this idea is actually inspired by her work. So instead of uh, fleshing out more theory to describe and explain what I want to uh, say, what I want to explain by nemocentric antagonism, and because I am here, and this is an event developed by my dear friend uh, Boris as a series of performances, I have decided to do something different. I would like to try, instead of doing theory here, I would like to simulate the experience of what I mean by nemocentric antagonism as an alternative to agonism or discourse ethics as a different idea of what politi politics or how politics, politics and think the notion of the public sphere, of collectivity, of pluralism. I would like to try to simulate the experience of the pneumocentric antagonism methodology that I think presents us with a far more powerful notion of the public sphere, one capable, and this is important for me, of realizing reason, and bringing out a forceful imaginary while not forgetting everyday political struggles. So, I've written a few lines and I'd like you to 
either focus on them, read them to yourselves, or say them after me in the most connected way possible. You can either repeat after me or say it to yourself, but I urge your kind full attention. So, this is a thought experiment. I know it's a thought experiment. I am a conscious self-modeling system, internally simulating a non-centered reality. This is a thought experiment. I know it's a thought experiment. I am a conscious self-modeling system, internally simulating a non-centered reality. Centerless. I am a simulate I am simulating a reality. In this simulation, there is a model of a person. I am simulating a reality. In this simulation, there is a model of a person. This model person is not me, but I have transferred to it all the properties I identify as mine. My beliefs about art, about politics, about right, about wrong. This model is an object. This model is an object. Its action is its thought. Like it is opaque. This model object person is moving on a vast plane, acting, thinking. Wait! Here comes a group of model persons. They have radically different opinions to the model person I am controlling. These models demand my model to give reasons for its beliefs and opinions. It responds and asks them to do the same. They challenge and negate each other's commitments. I cannot decide who wins because I am a conscious self-modeling system internally simulating a non-centered reality. Thank you very much.